My name is Father Pat Griffin. Most of you know me, I think. I'm the executive director for the Vincentian Center for Church and Society here at St. John's. This is Founders Week. Founders Week directs the attention of our university to St. Vincent de Paul and the values and the virtues that characterized his actions, his thinking, his life. We spend a week listening to presentations, to carrying out service, to worshiping together. We're especially blessed with a model in St. Vincent who calls us to respond to the gospel and the care of one another, and particularly the most marginalized. That's part of what we learn here at St. John's University. Today we have the opportunity to welcome a speaker and scholar, Dr. Bronwyn McShay, who has something to teach us about 17th century France, which was the environment of both the Duchess, of whom we will hear about, and St. Vincent de Paul, as well as Louise de Marillac and a lot of our other Vincentian figures. We're going to talk about those matters in a moment. Now let me invite you to join me in prayer. And then I'm going to say a few words about a schedule that we'll follow this afternoon. And finally, I'll introduce the EVP for Mission, the Executive Vice President for Mission, Father Aidan Rooney, CM, who will offer the official university welcome and introduction to our keynote speaker who is our initial, our inaugural, Vincentian Heritage Lecturer. Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the Jewish year. The Jewish community observed this day with both fasting and special prayer that has significance for both Jews and Christians. The daytime services of Yom Kippur are characterized by their emphasis on two themes, forgiveness and repentance. The ashray, an afternoon prayer, invites praise through the proclamation of Psalm 145. And so we pray in spirit with our Jewish sisters and brothers this afternoon. We pray. Happy are those who dwell in your house. May they always praise you. Happy is the people for whom it is so. Happy is the people for whom Adonai is their God. Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. Great is the Lord and worthy of much praise, whose grandeur is beyond understanding. One generation praises your deeds to the next and proclaims your mighty works. They celebrate your abounding goodness and joyfully sing of your justice. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. The Lord is good to all, compassionate toward all his works. All your works give you thanks, Lord, and your people, your faithful, bless you. As we do today, for you are God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <coughs> so our schedule. We've completed the initial welcome and prayer. In a moment, I will call upon Father Aiden to offer an official university welcome and introduce, introduction to Dr. McShay. This will be followed by Dr. McShay's presentation, after which she will entertain comments and questions. So think about the kind of things that you'd like to ask her. She has a level of knowledge which not many people are going to have and answers questions readily. After Dr. Mache is finished and she's entertained questions and comments from us, then we will bring our afternoon offering to a conclusion. And so, let me introduce my confrere, Father Aidan Rooney Sia.
I don't recall who first introduced me to Dr. Mache's work on the Duchess de Aguillon, but I picked it up and I read it straight through, and then I read it again, uh, using the Kindle highlighter to highlight those times and incidents that coincided with times and incidents that were already well known to me as important times in Vincent's or Louise's life. Um, and enjoyed doing it. And I want to say this without any flattery, it's, I can't remember the last time I read a book twice in a row. So it was fine. Bronwyn Catherine McShay is an historian and author of three books based here in New York City. She is also a visiting assistant professor of history with the Augustan Institute Graduate School in Denver. Additionally, she serves as an advisory editor for the Institutum Historicum Societatis Jesu in Rome. With advanced degrees from both Harvard University and Yale University, she is a scholar of early modern European history and of the history of Catholicism from late medieval to modern times. Furthermore, as a writer, speaker, and artist, Bronwyn is concerned broadly with the Christian faith as the bearer and shaper of culture. Born in nearby Jamaica Estates, here in Queens, of good hardy Woodside Queen stock, <laughs> we're happy to welcome her back home. Recently, in the book I mentioned, she turned her scholarly gaze to a very important person. She will talk about that, not I. St. Vincent is fairly well known to us. The other is not. She has been asked here not just to open our minds and give us new information, but also has been asked here for a significant purpose with a modest beginning. To relate the good news of the gospel to all dimensions of human reality requires a common ground, a contemporary interdisciplinary model which promotes shared inquiry between and among the disciplines and methodologies that constitute the contemporary university, the natural sciences, the social sciences, the humanities, and other scholarly disciplines. Special scholars can assist faculty and students in undertaking this collaborative work by teaching and deepening our understanding of the richness of the heritage upon which St. John's University stands. This interdisciplinary approach is indispensable for fostering collaborative creativity among scholars across the various disciplines and helping them relate their work to the overall mission of the university. Additionally, a Vincentian institution has a special responsibility to support and to disseminate scholarship that helps us understand our heritage more deeply. We hope that Dr. McShay's lecture today, the inaugural Vincentian Heritage <coughs> Lecture, will form the center of what will become an interdisciplinary endowed chair here at St. John's. And so, I am happy to introduce to you on this significant day, Dr. Bronwyn McShay. Thanks so much, uh, Fathers Rooney and, and Griffin, um, and everyone else here at St. John's who helped uh, uh, organize this event today, um, organize my visit. I'm really honored to be here uh, to help kick off this Vincentian Heritage Week. Um, and uh, Father Rooney, I'm, I'm really uh, genuinely uh, appreciative that you read my book twice. That, that, that's, uh, it's not easy to do that. It's 480 pages. So, um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of you now, Father. <laughs> um, so as you just heard, I'm an historian. And I've always, for some reason, had a deep interest in history uh, since I was quite young. And writing and teaching about the past was unsurprisingly a good fit for me when I was sorting out what sort of career to pursue when I was younger. Although I did consider becoming a lawyer and I, I would probably be making a, a lot more money right now if I had uh, pursued that path, but that's okay. Um, anyway, because I'm an historian, 
I actually like to check out some of the basic historical facts about places like this one, St. John's University, that kindly hosts me as a speaker. Um, and various things seem quite interesting to me about the history of your university. And among them is that prior to its founding, back in 1870, the local Catholic bishop, John Laughlin, uh, Laughlin, uh, a good Irish name, uh, looked specifically to a community of priests from the Congregation of the Mission, also known as Vincentian priests, as, as you all know very well here, to help educate the growing population under his care. And his flock included, indeed, a very large and growing population of immigrants from many countries and many working class and impoverished families, too. And the first slide here, make sure it's the slide I meant, yes. Um, so here are some fo photos of this bishop and very small in that other photo, some of the first Vincentian clergymen um, who helped build this university. So the bishop wanted Catholics under his care, no matter the challenges that they faced compared to some other more privileged groups in American society, to receive the benefits that a higher education offered, intellectual benefits, moral and spiritual benefits, practical benefits as well. So graduates of the new college, he knew, would have a chance at jobs and careers and also more stability and opportunities to flourish that they could share with their families and local communities that they otherwise could not have aimed at without such an education. And the Vincentian clergymen who became the first faculty members and administrators of St. John's were, in his view, especially suited to help make this happen, partly because they were guided by the legacy of their priestly congregation's founder, St. Vincent de Paul, who himself was a pioneer in his own time in establishing an array of institutions, including schools, that served and raised up the poor and the socially marginalized. And here's a famous portrait um, of the saint, which is based on the only known portrait done of him during his lifetime. Vincent actually didn't want his portrait done. The Duchess, who I'll tell you about, wanted to have his portrait done. They actually had to hire an artist to kind of spy on him through a peephole, like in his, in his basically the priest's dormitory while he was at his desk. Because he, he hated the idea, only rich people had their portraits done and he did not want this to be immortalized in this way. So um, thank goodness for the Duchess and her friends uh, who could paint. Um, now why, why do I find uh, such facts interesting as I just narrated to you? For one thing, uh, my own ancestors were immigrants and children of immigrants in the New York City area around the time this was all happening. So I feel a connection to some of that early history of St. John's because of some things I know about my family's history. But beyond that, as an historian, I have in recent years gotten to know a lot about St. Vincent de Paul and about various aspects of the founding era of the Vincentian priestly congregation. <coughs> And given various things that I've learned about St. Vincent and his times, there's something rather wonderful to me about the way his influence has reached across time and space and still does today uh, to places like New York. And the fact of that influence raises a question for me, um, part, partly scholarly um, uh, as a historian, but it's also a question that I ask as a woman and an ordinary lay member of the Catholic Church. And that question is, if we look closer at some of the history of Vincentian projects from the time of St. Vincent de Paul to the time when St. John's University was coming into the fore as a major Catholic university uh, in, in the young United States, were people like me and some of you in this audience today, that is members of the laity, including women, uh, along with priests and bishops, important to the development of those projects too. And I'm inclined to even consider such a question with you, partly because I learned only unexpectedly some years ago how important to St. Vincent de Paul and to the early ministries uh, of the priests of his congregation one particular woman and layperson was. And her name uh, was Marie de Vignerot, the Duchess of Aiguillon, very French name, and I've got an image of her on, and an image of my book uh, up, up on the screen. Uh, I'll explain about this book in a moment. Um, it's a free advertisement for my book. Um, <laughs> so her name was uh, Marie de Vigneron, as I said, and she was a French noblewoman with the title Duchess of Aiguillon. And I learned about her relationship with St. Vincent de Paul after realizing 
despite her having been forgotten for several centuries, that she was one of the most impressive and powerful Catholic leaders of her era, the 17th century, and that I should write her biography because of this. It took me some years to do the research and writing for this book, but the biography that I wrote came out this past March uh, during Women's History Month from Pegasus Books here in New York. Um, and this duchess, uh, she's the one, obviously, who's um, in the title of my talk today. So I titled the talk, The Saint and the Duchess, Collaboration at the Heart of the Vincentian Heritage. Because my goal in it, beginning with some details about this woman and her relationship with the saint, whose legacy is so important to this university and to the cause of serving the poor, generally, is to share with you some of my findings on the question I raised a moment ago about the importance of lay people, including lay women, in the history of Vincentian projects, including this university. So by the end of the talk, I hope that you'll have a better appreciation not only of how central collaboration between different kinds of people, such as priests and lay women, is to the Vincentian heritage of institutions such as St. John's, but also that you'll appreciate maybe ways that your own collaborations with others um, in various service projects, in professional and ministerial contexts, whether in the past, the present, or in the future, if you're thinking about um, getting involved with different things, how these fit into a larger historical picture. And perhaps my talk might inspire at least a few of you to dig into some more history on your own, uh, maybe in some cases for scholarly purposes, but more fundamentally also for, for inspiration and guidance for your lives and your projects today. So to zoom in now on, on the saint and the duchess uh, first, in this first part of my talk. So interestingly, just as I first stumbled across the strong ties to the Duchess of Aiguillon that uh, St. Vincent de Paul had, um, I stumbled across the Duchess herself by accident while researching the work uh, of another group of Catholic priests in the distant past, Jesuit missionaries who worked among various Native American peoples in North America in the 1600s and 1700s. Although I was focused in my first book project, uh, book, the book is called Apostles of Empire, um, on Jesuit missionaries who worked among Native American populations in French colonial contexts in North America, I learned during that project that one of the primary French lay people involved in helping to develop Catholic missions in 17th century North America was the Duchess of Aiguillon. And she worked with various priests and religious, for example, by establishing the first charitable hospital north of Mexico. And she staffed this hospital, which, which uh, was originally intended to cater more to Native Americans than to the French colonial population. Um, she staffed this hospital with Augustinian nuns. And these were some of the first Catholic women ever sent overseas from Europe to serve as missionaries. And the Duchess was also partly behind the selection of the first bishop in North America, north of Mexico. That is uh, Francois Xavier de Montmorency Laval, whom Pope Francis canonized as a saint in 2014. Now, all of this was unexpected for me because older histories that I had consulted <coughs> on the history of the church in colonial times focused almost exclusively on priests and religious, not on lay people, and especially not on lay women. So I began to keep a file on this duchess, and, and that file grew to such an extent, even before I was finishing writing Apostles of Empire, that I knew that my second book had to be focused on her. And this was especially after I had learned that only one other serious book had ever been written on her back in 1879 in French <laughs> and in a way that was partly scholarly but also partly fictional. So badly in need of updating. So the historian, when he couldn't find um, facts in the historical record, he would just sort of make some up that sounded good. <laughs> You're generally not allowed to do that as a historian, although occasionally people try to slip things in uh, today. So back to the Duchess and the Saint, and also an important figure, Cardinal Richelieu, whom I'll say something about in a moment. So in my book, La Duchesse, the Duchess, I discuss many remarkable things about this Duchess of Aiguillon. But as I have said, it's her relationship with St. Vincent de Paul that I want to underscore here. Now, de Paul was a peasant origins. 
in a very steeply hierarchical society. Um, we, have a, we have hierarchies in our society. Uh, in French society at that time, um, the social hierarchy was so steep that if you were a peasant, it was very difficult to have any kind of meaningful contact or kind of advancement in, in, in any professions um, in a world that was run by noble families. And so given how that society was structured, he needed wealthy noble patrons both to support his education and his formation as a priest if he wanted to go down this path, and also to engage in any kind of special ministries to the poor outside of an ordinary parish context on a larger scale. He needed the help of kind of wealthy, powerful people to help him make this happen. Now he had already received initial important assistance in this regard from other French nobles by the time he was in his late 40s and he met the young woman who would later become the Duchess of Aguillon. She was only in her 20s at the time, but she was considerably, considerably wealthy already. And she was serving as a high-ranking lady-in-waiting at the French royal court. Uh, and that was a more important job than maybe that phrase kind of says. They had a lot of, they controlled who accessed the, the queen, uh, and, and the, the queen actually was ruling the country. Her, her son was um, rather young, and so the queen mother was very important. So this was a political role, even though it's unofficial, um, being a lady-in-waiting. And she was known at the time as Madame de Combalet, and she had been married briefly uh, to a man with that surname who had died tragically in war, so she was a, a young, wealthy widow from a powerful noble family, and she helped bring De Paul and his commitment to serving the poor, especially in neglected rural communities, to the attention of her powerful uncle, the Cardinal Duke de Richelieu, who was the most powerful statesman at the French court. And Cardinal Richelieu and his niece together would become some of the most important supporters of De Paul's early projects. So the early projects of De Paul's that Marie and her uncle supported included the education of young Vincentian seminarians in Paris, the establishment of a Vincentian community and its first missions to the rural poor in Marie's Duchy of Aguillon, uh, in a region of France that was far from Paris, the, the capital. Uh, they also supported the establishment of Vincentian ministries as well in the Duchy of Richelieu in the Loire Valley, also part of the domains of their family. And in that area, many Catholic peasants were struggling with poverty and poor health, and they did not have sufficient numbers of clergymen and religious tending to their physical, educational, or spiritual needs. So the rural poor uh, areas in France were badly in need of, of clergymen because they, they would tend to kind of uh, flock to the cities and, and they would have more kind of opportunities to preach in the cities. Um, so the Vincentians, with Marie and her uncle's support, would begin to make real differences in the lives of some of these poor Catholics from the 1630s onward. Now in this same period, St. Vincent de Paul also famously began to work with another wealthy widow, Louise de Mariac, who I'm sure some of you know about. Um, she would also be canonized as a saint. And she and Vincent collaborated in establishing one of the most innovative women's congregations of the period, the Daughters of Charity. And the Daughters of Charity pursued, at, and still pursue today, an intensive life of prayer, in some ways similar to that of traditional nuns living in cloistered convents, but who also, different from traditional nuns at the time, worked out in the streets and in people's homes and in hospitals and even prisons, where generally people didn't think women should be in prisons ministering uh, to people there. They would minister to the socially marginalized and to the sick in very hands-on ways. And the Daughters of Charity were affiliated with a growing network of charitable-minded, noble women who became known as the Ladies of Charity. And these ladies, and the, the word lady at that time didn't simply mean that you, you had good manners. Uh, um, it, it meant that you were a noble woman. You were sort of in that upper rank of society. The ladies built up a very innovative Catholic lay women's organization dedicated to helping struggling populations. And this was an organization unlike any really that the Catholic world had ever seen. And our Duchess, Marie, 
was one of the first women involved with the Ladies of Charity. And they, uh, she also became very supportive uh, as well of the Daughters of Charity in Paris and over time uh, in consultation with St. Vincent and St. Louise uh, in other parts of France. And she, so she was very devoted to their projects uh, for many decades of her life, actually, from the 1630s all the way up to the time of her death in the 1670s. But a bit more about that later. So Marie's support of de Paul's work, in particular, uh, the Vincentian's work from the beginning, involved more than simply passively giving money to finance the work of the first Vincentian clergyman. She had some of her own ideas for what sort of ministries the Vincentian clergyman could build up in different places. And she worked with de Paul to develop some of the most uh, famous of these. And indeed, in the years after her uncle Richelieu's death in 1642, which by virtue of everything he left to her, um, money and titles and, and, and a lot of power, um, uh, made her one of the wealthiest, most independently powerful women in all of Europe, let alone in France. The Duchess emerged as St. Vincent de Paul's most consistently enterprising and ambitious patron and collaborator. For example, she was considerably responsible for the Vincentians becoming established in the French Mediterranean port city of Marseille, where the priests worked especially among prisoners who were forced to work as veritable slaves as their punishments in French galley ships and in support of the French Navy generally in the region. And in time, the Vincentians also ran a hospital there too, um, a charitable hospital for the poor and for these um, galley, galley prisoners. Um, and the, the Duchess was very supportive of these projects. Now, she also quite significantly helped the Vincentians expand to Rome, founding their main house and seminary there, which soon enabled de Paul's congregation to become respected by the papacy and many cardinals of the church. The Duchess of Aguillon also, with St. Vincent de Paul, was especially concerned that men who entered the priesthood were well-educated and, and, and that they were not motivated in pursuing the priesthood either for worldly career reasons, as happened a lot in those days, or mainly because their families had pushed them into their uh, priestly vocations, which also happened a lot in those days. These were real and chronic problems in the 17th century. So the Vincentian seminary in Rome that the Duchess uh, uh, founded uh, with St. Vincent de Paul and other seminaries in France as well that she helped to establish over time became very respected for producing young clergymen who were very serious about their callings to serve the church as priests, who were able to articulate points of the Catholic faith to others in straightforward and compelling terms, not overly complicated terms, and who were also very intentional about serving the poor and the sick and the socially marginal, all in accord with St. Vincent de Paul's overarching founding vision. Now, one of the most interesting things I learned about the Duchess's collaborative relationship with de Paul um, is that the saint was able, with Marie's support and her skillful negotiations, with various bishops of the church and French royal officials to expand his congregation, not only to Rome, but also into parts of Africa. And specifically, the Vincentians began to pursue missions among the poor, mostly among enslaved Christians, but sometimes among people of other faiths where local officials did not forbid it, in and around the North African cities of Tunis and Algiers, in what are today the countries of Tunisia and Algeria. And the Duchess also led the effort for the Vincentians to establish a charitable hospital in Algiers. Now I should clarify, this was not a time when the French had colonies in North Africa as they would in modern times. The Duchess, because of her high position in France, was able to work out an unusual arrangement whereby the Vincentians were attached to the French embassies, or the consulates rather, in North Africa a region that was then ruled by officials of the Islamic Ottoman Empire. So the Muslim Ottomans were imperialistic in this region before Europeans were powerful enough uh, to kind of move in later on as did happen in modern times. 
So the French, um, they, they were there as merchants and missionaries, kind of welcomed, tolerated by the Islamic authorities in North Africa. They did a lot of trading and other business with the Ottomans. And just as countries maintain embassies and consulates in other countries today, the French did so in various parts of the Ottoman Empire, as they did in various European countries. Now, because of the manner in which the Vincentians were able to maintain a presence in North Africa, De Paul and other clergymen often took direction from the Duchess on how the Vincentian missionaries stationed in North Africa were to conduct themselves. So this was a rather unorthodox thing she did. She actually had Vincentians staff the embassies. It's like having the American amb ambassador to, um, to France or another country be a priest who's chosen by a leader who's devoted to helping the poor. Uh, this was a very unusual decision. Normally you'd have a layman, a powerful nobleman in that position. So um, I would like to add though, the French were involved in preliminary colonial activity in other parts of the world at this time, including Madagascar, the large island off the southeastern coast of the African continent. So through her cousin, the Duke de la Melere, uh, who commanded some ships and operated a trading company, the Duchess uh, was able to help the Vincentians go to Madagascar to serve as the chaplains to the French merchants and with the hope of establishing uh, missions there. That mission was short-lived because the French colonial effort there in the mid-17th century was also short-lived. But I want to underscore not only how significant historically the Duchess was to the Vincentians becoming an international congregation very early in their founding period, but also how unusual it was for a woman to be involved in any way in this sort of activity. And St. Vincent de Paul himself really stands out, I would say, in this era as a clergyman very willing to work in this collaborative way with this woman and with other women. And this woman was much younger than himself. Yes, she was very powerful <laughs> compared to him. Um, but he, he also encouraged her to be bold in her efforts. And he encouraged other women to kind of be ambitious, to serve God and the church, even to the point of risking some social disapproval based on some of the gender norms of the period. Now on this point, um, I just want to circle back to the Duchess's involvements with the Ladies of Charity. So in the year 1653, when she was in her late 40s, Marie was chosen to serve as the president of the Ladies of Charity, a role that she went on to fulfill dutifully for two decades. And in her capacity as the president of the Ladies of Charity, the Duchess worked with St. Vincent and with St. Louis de Marillac to support and expand an array of ministries to the poor in France, including to poor girls who needed education, and assistance in finding respectable employment. And they, they pursued projects like this in ways that really helped to put charitable Catholic women on the map, so to speak, as, as a real force in French society. Um, and in a society, too, that was rather too tolerant, despite its pro official professions of being a Catholic kingdom, um, of, there were, it was a bit too tolerant of widespread suffering among poorer populations due to the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a few, and due also to rather terrible wars and economic crises that were caused often by squabbling nobles who did not much care if peasants and poor migrants got caught in the crossfire, as often happened. Now, the Duchess and other ladies of charity and the daughters of charity of the 17th century, encouraged by St. Vincent de Paul and other Vincentian clergymen, were actually able to set precedents for other Catholic women in France and far beyond France who began to mobilize in more organized, large-scale ways than was seen before in the church's history uh, for the sake of diverse ministries related to poverty relief, health care, education, the rehabilitation of prisoners, care for orphans and the elderly, and so on. Now, my book offers more details than probably any of you want right now about the, Duchess, the Duchess's collaborative efforts with de Paul and the other first Vincentians, including a few details about times that the saint and his patroness did not always get along. Um, they had very human squabbles occasionally um, about you know, different points of view about different things. And I, I don't have time to get into those there. Some of them are kind of amusing. Uh, my favorite, I'll, I'll just mention one. Vincent. 
uh, like to ride around on a like a simple like a, a mule basically or like a an ugly horse you know he didn't he wanted to sort of live like a peasant the duchess insisted as he got older and kind of had a bad leg that he drive in a very nice carriage that she supplied him with several horses it wasn't that fancy but he described it as like monstrously he was he was so embarrassed it's like being given a um like a Maserati or something in 17th century, right? And he just didn't want to be seen in this. So he would, he would sometimes tie up the fancy horses to like, like poles and like random farm lands and, and he would just leave them there. And the, the Duchess, and he had this battle over this rig that I, I just was so amused by this. Um, anyway, but more important than that, um, she did win out in the end in that, in that matter. Um, but um, more important than that, I want to mention that the Duchess uh, really lost a dear friend and something of a father figure. Her own father had died young um, when St. Vincent de Paul died at the age of 79 in 1660. She attended his funeral in Paris and significantly she was also a leader in promoting his cause for sainthood, which eventually succeeded um, after her lifetime. Now I'd like to mention too, before I kind of expand our scope a bit here, that de Paul's first biographer, a bishop named Louis uh, Abeli, credited the Duchess for her very important role in the life and career of de Paul and in the founding era of the Vincentians generally. But unfortunately, somewhat ironically, later biographers, people who lived after the 17th century, downplayed the role of such women uh, in, in Vincent de Paul's life. Um, so there was kind of an, a false impression kind of set in over time that, that most of uh, uh, St. Vincent's relationships with powerful women, such as the Duchess, were simply them being you know, really inspired by his charisma and doing the things he asked them to do. It was much more collaborative and sort of a two-way inspiration. Um, and, and his first biographer saw this and understood this. And so it, it took a, a, a long time for this view to kind of be uh, question by historians today. And, and so I'm glad that I've had an opportunity as one of these historians to help set some of the records straight with regard to the Duchess's role in his life. Now moving now uh, to some times and places a bit closer to our own. Because I, I realize most of you in this room are not, want, don't want to spend your entire life in the 17th century like I do. Um, maybe 80% of my life, not the whole thing. Um, so I have a map of the world in the early 1800s. I want to tell you a bit about examples of Vincentian clergymen um, who worked with lay people as they became a more truly international congregation in modern times. Now in the late 1700s, Vincentian clergymen began to spread out from Europe to various lands around the world, including Ottoman Turkey and China. By the end of the year 1818, the places around the world where Vincentian clergymen could be found far from their original home in France included the young United States. And remarkably, several years before Mississippi and the Midwest had even become a US state, a group of Vincentians, including uh, a priest, Father uh, Félix de Andres, uh, depicted on the screen, um, I gave him a French pronunciation, but he was Italian, apologies, the Italians in the room, um, established the first Catholic seminary west of the Mississippi River. They were urged to do this by the French Caribbean born bishop of the very large diocese that encompassed Missouri at the time. Uh, this was Bishop Louis de Bourg. And they were encouraged also by a local Catholic layman who led a group of fellow Catholics from Kentucky to settle in the region. And his name was Isidore Moore. I don't have Isidore Moore's picture here, but he was a devout lay Catholic who was very important to the early settlement and government of Missouri generally, as well as to the development of Catholic institutions in the region, including by um, the first Vincentian clergyman uh, in that, in that uh, territory. Now the new seminary that Moore collaborated with Vincentians and with Bishop de Bourg to build up was established in a town called Perryville in Missouri. And it was called St. Mary of the Barrens. And importantly, it soon had a college for lay students, um, kind of a very early example of uh, like the institution that was founded here at St. John's. 
Um, and that was at a time when hardly any institutions of higher learning existed for Catholics in the United States, which had a very large Protestant majority uh, that sometimes discriminated against Catholics. And there were very few Catholic institutions, uh, certainly educational ones of a higher level. Uh, at that time. So St. Mary of the Barons was primarily intended as a traditional seminary for training priests, however, so in time the two institutions were separated and developed in their own ways. Now the first Vincentian clergyman uh, to direct this first seminary west of the Mississippi was named Joseph Rosati. He was also Italian born. And his leadership was so effective that Bishop Du Bourg soon elevated him as a bishop. And indeed, when St. Uh, Louis, Missouri became the seat of a new diocese of the church, able to break off from the, uh, the original large territorial diocese that Du Bourg was in charge of, um, because there were enough Catholics now in the region to, to warrant that, father turned Bishop Rosati was made the first ever bishop of St. Louis. Now as a bishop, this Vincentian clergyman was able to collaborate with the full range of Catholics moving around and through his diocese at a time of much immigration, uh, crisscrossing of the young United States by pioneers, by various groups, and building up of towns and cities of all kinds uh, uh, with businesses, religious institutions, educational institutions, and so on that new towns and cities needed in order to, <coughs> to thrive. For example, he collaborated with wealthy and not wealthy but still generous lay Catholics to establish and build up St. Louis's first Basilica Cathedral, which was dedicated to St. Louis of France, partly because there were many Catholics in the region of French ancestry. And there were still a lot of active ties to France in that part of the world uh, due to French colonialism um, before this part of the world became part of the United States. Now that church, built between 1831 and 1834, served as the cathedral in St. Louis until the early 1900s, when a much larger structure was built, which is the home of the Archbishop of St. Louis today. Furthermore, by the time Rosati was the first Bishop of St. Louis, uh, the papacy had restored the Jesuit order. The Jesuits uh, had been suppressed for a time, it's a long story. Um, but Jesuit clergymen were encouraged by the Vincentian Bishop, Rosati, to build up what is today the very successful Catholic university known as St. Louis University, which is one of the oldest Catholic universities in the United States. Now, as had been the case from the beginning of the Vincentian's history in the time of St. Vincent de Paul, the Vincentian clergymen in early 19th century Missouri worked closely with women in building up Catholic institutions and ministries. And among these were St. Rose Philippine Duchesne, a French-born religious sister from a congregation called the Society of the Sacred Heart, and other sisters who um, crossed the Atlantic with her. Duchesne and other sisters built up the Academy of the Sacred Heart in St. Charles, Mississippi. This was the first free school for children west of the Mississippi, meaning that no tuition was required for admission. Duchenne and other such women working with the Vincentians in the region were pioneers of education generally in the United States, not just pioneers of Catholic education. So the, the story of education, educational institutions in general, um, uh, these, these are important figures for that. <clears throat> now significantly too, Bishop Rosati, Father de Andres, and other Vincentian clergymen in the region also welcomed Daughters of Charity uh, into the region. Uh, Daughters of Charity, who stood in the tradition of St. Louis de Mariac. And they established the first hospital west of the Mississippi River and the first Catholic charitable hospital in the United States altogether. Uh, these women, who belonged to a community of Daughters of Charity, founded in the state of Maryland by the first U.S. citizen to be a saint, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, actually traveled some 1,500 miles from Maryland to St. Louis in the days before railroads, let alone before cars and airplanes. And that was in the year 1828. This hospital was initially called the Sisters Hospital, and it, housed, uh, at, it was housed at first in a tiny log cabin. Um, and the Daughters of Charity were supported uh, in their earliest days in Missouri by a Catholic merchant, a layman named John Mulanfi. Uh, whose name was eventually given to the hospital. So this hospital, run by the daughters, 
and by the layman doctors who served as physician there, physicians, um, dramatically expanded over time. Um, and it, it also was rather uh, radical for its time in employing one of the first university-trained female physicians in the United States, Dr. Nancy Levell. And in time, this hospital became a large and important one for the city of St. Louis and was renamed DePaul Medical Center in the 20th century. Now, while Vincentians, Daughters of Charity, and various lay clerical and religious friends and collaborators of, of theirs were busy building up some of the very first Catholic institutions in the young United States, Vincentian institutions and principles regarding the central importance to a Christian life of serving the poor while being prayerfully devoted to God, were undergoing a revival back in France, the country where they had first appeared in the days of St. Vincent de Paul um, and, and the Duchess of Aguillon and St. Louis de Marillac. Now, why do I say a revival? Well, France, toward the end of the 1700s, had undergone a very violent revolution that involved some horrible attacks on some of its Catholic institutions and religious <clears throat> and charitable communities. And indeed, a group of Daughters of Charity in northern France, under the leadership of a, a devout woman devoted to serving the poor, named Marie Madeleine de Fontaine, uh, were among many religious sisters, as well as priests and brothers, and devout lay Catholics who were executed by the dreaded guillotine during that revolution, simply because they refused to bow subserviently to zealous ideologues who had temporarily <coughs> taken control of the government. Now, in the early 1800s, however, Catholic life in France was recovering from this rather terrible period. And the Vincentians, the Daughters of Charity, and other communities were growing in number uh, once again. And they were able to pursue various ministries in French society in relative peace. And also, as always, with the support of lay friends. And this brings me to one of the most famous lay Catholics associated with the Vincentian family of institutions, um, Blessed Frederick Ozanam. In 1833 in Paris, the man that you see up on the screen established a lay society called the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, this was Frederick Ozanam, and he, like the martyred Daughters of Charity I just mentioned, is currently being considered for canonization as a saint in the Catholic Church. Now, Ozanam was a French journalist and a scholar. He lived from 1813 to 1853, and his name may be familiar to some of you here through the university's Ozanam Scholars Program, uh, which encourages both academic excellence and service to the poor among St. John's students who are awarded its scholarship funds. And one of my young cousins, she's not here for me to embarrass her, she's in Rome right now, is actually an Ozanam Scholar, so um, I was wishing she would be here during my visit uh, to, to embarrass her, but she's not. Um, so Ozanam, as a young man in France, uh, during a time of much social and political change was an outspoken and dedicated Catholic layman who felt personally challenged by critics of his day who basically accused the church of not doing enough for the poor despite its rhetoric about that. Uh, there were many impoverished people living in <coughs> slum conditions in Paris uh, during his lifetime and he felt he was a journalist, he was promoting Catholic ideas in the press, and he, he felt a personal call to kind of put his, his commitments into more action. So he started the Society of St. Vincent de Paul while also being a professor in Paris and, and a journalist, and also being a, a husband and father, living an ordinary family life. So the Society of Vincent de Paul remains famously active today as a worldwide Catholic society that promotes the holiness of the laity through dedicated service to the poor. And Ozanam collaborated with a leading daughter of charity at the time, Sister Rosalie Rondeau, who's also being considered for canonization by the church today. And remarkably, their work among the poor in France, which they pursued with many other lay people, who joined the movement and in collaboration with various priests and religious brothers and sisters was so effective that their society grew very dramatically and internationally in just a few decades. It expanded to England, Ireland, the young United States, um, also in, beginning in St. Louis, Missouri, for example. Um, it expanded also uh, to places as far away as Australia and India. And today, the Society of St. Vincent de Paul is one of the largest Catholic charitable organizations in the world. I, it's active in, I think, over 150 countries. 
And as some of you here can probably speak better about than I can, I understand there's an active chair, chapter of the society uh, here at St. John's University that students are members of. And that it has the distinction of being the oldest university-based chapter in the United States. So this brings me, hopefully I'm sort of in the ballpark of our time. <laughs> Father, I'm sort of lost track of when I began here. Um, this brings me back to the founding era of your university. Uh, which I brought up at the start of this talk. So on this general theme of collaboration between clergymen, religious, and lay people, Bishop Laughlin and the Vincentian priests who first dreamed up what would become St. John's University knew very well that a successful institution of higher learning had to be the work of many hands working together. So a newspaper article from 1868 that I learned about uh, because it's featured on your university's website so I did a really deep dive of research there. Um, it demonstrates how much collaboration with a variety of other people was on the agenda of the clergymen founders even before St. John's was even established. And I, I can't imagine you can read all that text there. I'm, I'll quote some of it. Uh, so we read, for example, in this article, which appeared in a newspaper called the Brooklyn Eagle, that Bishop Laughlin was already, or Laughlin, excuse me, was already in 1868 in conversation with many priests and laymen, and that priests of the congregation of the mission of St. Vincent de Paul had already formally undertaken the enterprise, both as regards the raising of the funds and the supervision of the college, and that the priests were successfully reaching out not only to Catholic laymen, but also to many friends of education and citizens of public spirit, as it was put, who wanted to help. That is, the clergymen who founded your university collaborated even with people who were, quote, not members of the Catholic Church, who provided large donations to the college. And among them um, was the mayor of Brooklyn, Martin uh, Kalbfleisch, who was of Dutch Protestant heritage. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I was sometimes told by people who seemed to know a lot about the history uh, of the church in the old days, um, in the days uh, long before the dramatic changes that the church underwent at the time of Vatican II, uh, there was kind of an impression I was given that the Catholics were very close to Protestants and other non-Catholics. Now, while there was certainly uh, some bad blood between Catholics and others in the 1800s <laughs> and early centuries, earlier centuries, and even a lot of violence at times between different Christian groups and between Christians and non-Christians, to be sure, I'm not, I'm not downplaying that. There is also a bit of a myth, too, out there about the absence, alongside all of that, of friendly, helpful relationships between Catholics, Protestants, and others, that the study of history, including the history of institutions like your own, can help us challenge a bit. And in fact, there are a lot of examples of cooperation between Catholics and non-Catholics in the 19th century, and even going all the way back to the time of St. Vincent de Paul and the Duchess. Uh, just as there is a lot of evidence, not always appreciated that much until recent times, of the kind of collaboration among priests, religious, and lay people, including lay women, as I've been highlighting uh, for you today. So in short, history, uh, including the history of institutions as close to home as St. John's, has a lot in it that I think is instructional and even inspirational for us to consider. Uh, even as, as history, of course, also holds a lot of troubling things in it as well. Um, human beings have always been causing problems for one another, going all the way back to the time when sin and evil corrupted our relationships with one another and uh, pulled us away from the loving relationships that God intends for us and seeks to bring us back to. Now this points us uh, to what I think is what is ultimately most at stake for us in considering the history of people like St. Vincent de Paul and his friend, the Duchess of Aguillon, who lived so long ago. They lived in a world that was full of injustices and inequities, and in a world even uh, that despite the public commitment of their government to the principles of Christianity, saw a great deal of sin and evil at work in the relationships among their fellow Catholics and others in France, <coughs> including in the way that too many with wealth and power in their time neglected and even made things worse for the poor in both the cities and the countryside. But they were moved enough in their prayers and by their commitments to the principles of their faith to try to do something different and something significant with their lives to combat 
some of these problems, to actually live the principles of Christianity, as well as to promote them through words. And they understood that they could be much stronger and more effective working together, standing up against big problems by collaborating as people on the same team, so to speak, no matter how different their specific callings were or their social origins were. Uh, we have a priest from peasant origins and we have a laywoman of noble origins. Kind of their work together kind of represents four different groups that you don't always think uh, would have been working together in those times. Now to cite your university website again, I wish I enjoyed uh, going through actually, um, we read the following about the importance of St. Vincent de Paul to the university's self-understanding. If you'll allow me to quote it just a little bit, I promise I'm, I'm wrapping this up. Um, St. John's University looks to St. Vincent de Paul for its vision and inspiration. Early in his ministries as a priest in the 17th century, Vincent discovered that one finds God and oneself in service to others his conviction guides St. John's students, faculty, and staff, and alumni in using their education to help build a better world. And then it goes on with some history. During Vincent's lifetime, Paris and rural France were marked by the affluence of the few and the poverty of the masses. Vincent combined faith, a keen intellect, and a considerable business acumen to revolutionize methods of caring for the poor um, and educating those in need. Um, and I, I won't read this whole thing, but it mentions that he worked closely with St. Louis de Marillac and that he organized hospitals for the poor, founded asylums for the orphaned, opened workshops for the unemployed, championed literacy for the uneducated, including for women, advocated for the incarcerated. He also advanced the education and formation of clergy. Now, if any of you have read these words before on the website, I hope that some of them seem a bit more alive to you now uh, after some of the things I've discussed this afternoon. And I also hope that you have a better appreciation that as famous as St. Vincent de Paul is as a great saint of the church, and as someone who many of us encounter literally on pedestals in the form of statues and, and see in paintings and, and in mosaics uh, in, in the beautiful chapel that I visited earlier, um, he was also a human being, just like all of us, who could not have accomplished as much as he did for the poor and the sick without a great deal of help from others, including lay people, some of whom even helped him determine what some of those specific goals in his ministry should be in the first place. Oops, okay. Um, and I hope that knowing that even a, a saint as honored as St. Vincent de Paul, that even someone like him needed a lot of help from others to become who he became and knowing, too, how important collaborative work between different kinds of people uh, has been throughout history in the buildup and success of many Vincentian institutions and ministries, including your own university, I hope that uh, some of you who have desires to make a real positive difference in the lives of others feel more inspired to reach out to other people, including ones different from you in various ways, for their ideas, for a helping hand, even perhaps to work alongside you on projects that you already are busy with, and, and care about and want to build up even more. So that's, that's all I have to say. I'm, I'm happy to field questions. So. Should I just uh, call on people I see or, or what? Yes, they should use the microphone. Oh, oh OK, thank you. OK. Thank you so much for everything that you shared. Um, I think you, for me, you tied together a lot of the pieces that, um, or filled in the gaps that maybe I hadn't known before. Um, a lot of times when we talk about St. Vincent and uh, the work that was funded, we often refer to the de Gandhi family mm -hmm. and Madame de Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about any relationship that you know of between Madame de Gandhi and the Duchess or yeah. how she played into that? It's Thank So you. it's, um, I, I didn't find too much data about it, but um, the, uh, the Duchess actually learned about DePaul through another young lady in waiting who had the, the wonderful name uh, Madeleine de Silly, S-I-L-L-Y. Uh, in French, it doesn't mean silly, but she was actually, I think, the sister of Madame de Gandhi, who is the famous uh, patroness, original noble patron of DePaul. Uh, she and her husband was a, a, an official 
Um, there were the, the, the Gandhi uh, family, they were high-ranking officials, known to the Richelieu family. Um, but there was also this uh, young, young woman's friendship at the heart of it that was sort of connected. So I don't know of too many kind of personal dealings that are documented between Madame de Gandhi and the Duchess, um, but they, they would have attended a lot of the same functions. They, there, there's a lot more uh, that happened that is just not documented, so I can't really speak in detail, but, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that fascinating talk. Um, so, you know, as a historian, I could sit here and ask you a lot of questions, but I'm not going to for everyone, I'm just going to narrow myself to two questions that have some kind of like sub questions that are uh, attached to them. Haha, <laughs> one of these famous uh, just two questions. So, my first question, and this is partly because I'm teaching a, a women and gender class right now, and some of the things you've said about um, that the uh, Daughters of Charity, for instance, were doing things that were seen as a bit scandalous for women in um, 17th century France to do kind of touch on this. But, um, these relationships of patronage between these powerful noble women and St. Vincent de Paul, how were they viewed in this heavily hierarchical society? Obviously, patronage in the culture of the court is extremely important, but here we have it clock, uh, traversing class boundaries, mm -hmm. also traversing gender boundaries in some important ways. Was that seen as uh, improper? Was that seen as... Um, so would, did the, was this something that other people of a lower class, other um, uh, religious of a lower class were able to do as successfully as um, <coughs> St. Vincent? Just how, that, how one would go about uh, creating these bonds of patronage in, in this um, environment mm -hmm. and maybe to talk more specifically about the gender angle of what was going on with these connections. And then my second question relates to um, the importance of uh, uh, the Duchess in um, the canonization process. Mm -hmm. And I'm just struck by, like, imagine having a person who's your friend, um, who you're, like, uh, you know, trying to convince not to take his donkey around <laughs> town, but then you're also, like, this man is a saint. Um, what does that mean? Like, how... What did she, how did she kind of balance these two things of viewing him as a human, but also viewing him as, as a man on a pedestal? How do we see that coming into play when she's trying to get him canonized? Yeah, I think, can I, uh, the second uh, question is a shorter answer. So um, I think the, my, my impression uh, in those days the, the viewing saints on a pedestal and as sort of less than hu or more than human, that seems to be a bit more of a modern phenomenon. I, th I think there was more of a comfort level that very holy people were very human too. Um, and uh, th there was kind of a, there was a very living relationship. Um, the, the French noble families who were active in the Catholic reform movement knew people like Francis de Sales and Jean de Chantal, people who they, they sort of suspected were going to be canonized. And um, like canonization efforts were regularly started on behalf of people they knew very personally. And, and in fact, you look at the history of canonization, that, that's often the case. Uh, um, I, I think of like Joan of Arc's mother survived her, and you know, her daughter was burned at the stake as a heretic, but her mother. Most mothers are not convinced their daughters are saints, but, but her mother kind of helped push the restitution of her, of her uh, reputation. Um, so I think that there was a, more of a comfort level with that than I think, I, I, maybe it's traditions of, of hagiography, how saints biographies have been written in modern times are a little different than they actually were back then. So, um, so I, we could go do more of a deep dive into that, <laughs> but, uh, but I'll move to the first question. Um, I didn't have any sense that the patronage relationship per se was seen as scandalous in some way. Um, the only real kind of uh, opposition that I encountered in the sources about the Duchess's uh, generosity and focus on, on figures like Vincent de Paul and projects for the poor often came from close relatives of hers 
who wanted the money to stay in the family and not to be given out to uh, poor, pro, uh, the poor. Um, they, they thought the, the Richelieu money was kind of being dispersed to projects that, that uh, were not what they wanted for, uh, for like private uh, ambition projects. So there's some controversy uh, that you see more around that sometimes. And the idea that, that a woman was controlling this fortune once her uncle died, that was rather unusual. And Richelieu actually made a very exceptional move. He, like, he went contrary to all French law in, in making sure his niece, rather than her brother, who was kind of a disastrous gambler, um, inherited uh, the power and the money. And so a lot of the scandal had to do with her relationship with her uncle more than the relationship with de Paul. Um, I think at the time, his being a peasant and a priest, uh, it was pretty commonplace for noble women as well as noble men to kind of sponsor projects. What stands out with the Daughters of Charity and the Ladies of Charity was how kind of active uh, in public, in spaces women normally weren't supposed to be that active. Um, and the, the more sort of noble you were, the more scandal there would be. You're not supposed to, not, not necessarily, um, it's not just that you're going into a place like a prison or into a poor neighborhood, but actually doing physical work on behalf of people as a noble person was seen as below your station. Um, and there's a bit of a myth that the ladies of charity never did any of that, that it was only the daughters of charity who came from poor backgrounds. Um, but that's actually a little bit of a myth. Some of the ladies actually did engage in hands-on direct contact with the poor and prisoners and um, to the point that even Cardinal Richelieu was kind of, when he was alive, thought his niece was being too, too up close and personal with, with, the, with elements he didn't want her, his niece hanging out with. So there, there was some scandal within the families about the, the work, I would say more than the actual pa patronage relationship. So. Bronwyn, thanks for that great lecture. Um, I have a sort of a follow-up question about patronage. Uh, as somebody whose job entails raising money, uh, I've always found Vincent to be an inspiration, mm -hmm. and particularly the way he used his power and his access to money to direct that money to the poor. And, and I'm curious about the role of patronage in France or in Europe in this time in supporting projects for the poor. Like we're familiar with patronage of the arts, mm -hmm. Were there other sort of social justice activists that were using patronage to fund pro projects for the poor in the way Vincent was, or was he an innovator in that respect? My impression, he's an innovator in part, um, partly in, in connection with this, with the Daughters of Charity, Lady Charity, with this, this kind of women being out in the streets, but also being, like the innovation has to partly do with the form of life that they're pursuing. Um, there were other, groups doing similar things. The, the Daughters of Charity are famous because they're one of the few organizations, partly because of good leadership by Louise de Marriac, uh, Ladies of Charity, the Duchess of Avignon, St. Vincent. It survived beyond the time period. But they're, like historians of France in this time can actually document many similar uh, kinds of congregations that were devoted to charitable service that were shorter lived. Some, some of the organizations evolved over time, um, became focused only on education or only on hospital work. Um, the Augustinian charitable hospital I mentioned in, in um, North America, which the Duchess patronized, there were charitable hospitals like that run by Augustinian religious sisters that were kind of innovative in their devotion to hospital work in the same period. I mean, I, I know the Jesuit order uh, actually better in some ways than the, the Vincentian um, congregation because of my previous work. The Jesuits also were masters at getting wealthy patrons to help them and collaborating with them on a wide range of projects, educational, charitable. Um, they, they also were involved with charitable hospitals in different places and often in kind of mission settings where you didn't have the infrastructure that you had in European cities, so, um, so yeah, there's, there's a whole world of this going on. Um, and the Vincentians, I'd, I'd say, are, are among the most effective at it, but they're not, they're not by themselves, certainly. That's the best I can do <laughs> in a short couple minutes there.
thank you very much, Dr. McShay, for your uh, presentation. Th th this kind of follows mm -hmm. Mike's question about patronage, because I'm thinking about, and this is the theologian asking this question, um, the theological motivation for people like the Duchess and others mm -hmm. to um, connect with and, um, you know, and fund these kinds of projects. Um, and even in, in your research with the Jesuits, I mean, my, my sense is that there is a very strong theological motivation here. Can you speak a little bit to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the Duchess, um, well, I, I can, I'm gonna tie this to St. Vincent. One of St. Vincent's early supporters was Cardinal de Berulle, who was a <laughs> founder. He helped uh, bring the Discalce Carmelites to France. And um, the Duchess of Aguillon, when she was a young widow, attempted to become a Discalce Carmelite in the tradition of Teresa of Avila. And her uncle Richelieu forbade this. He made her leave the convent um, so that she could be politically useful to him at court. But she developed a very strong, uh, I would say, Carmelite spirituality, very focused on devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. And she had a rather strong, it can be, the, the language can be a bit startling uh, to modern people, but she had a very strong devotion to the, uh, the blood of Christ in particular. And uh, some of her founding documents, like the contracts, she, she started with uh, the Augustinians in Canada um, and other um, charitable projects she was involved with in France, underscored the idea that Christ shed his blood for all people, not just for the wealthy or just for people who are already good Catholics. Or like, she had a very, um, kind of a very strong universal sense that Christ was pouring himself out to all and that anyone who's gonna call themselves uh, a, a Christian, especially one with a lot of wealth and power and the ability to do something, should be more outward looking than, uh, than many people in her social class were. So she, she had a very strong motivation. You see it, not, uh, not much of her correspondence survived, sadly. She burned a lot of her letters, which is very annoying for a biographer. And <laughs> makes me wonder what secrets did she have? She's burning. Um, I have a theory about uh, the great love of her life that she was hiding from people, but but that's another story we can talk about another time. Um, so, but but she um, yeah she had a strong motivation. I think um, uh, Vincent de Paul and, and there's a lot of documentation of his speaking to the daughters of charity, the conferences uh, where he elaborates. Um, I can't speak expertly on that, but uh, Vincent de Paul's motivation is all over the sources. If you read him in his own words, um, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe I can use the, mm -hmm. the microphone to mm -hmm. do it. And just one of the things you probably ran into, and you mm -hmm. mentioned it in the book, mm -hmm. that there was a, a, a spiritual movement known as the Devo. Yes, that time. Mm -hmm. people shared the same literature together mm -hmm. and wrote to each other about it, and mm -hmm. some of their formation came directly from. Uh, from uh, uh, Dominicans, mm -hmm. from uh, the Belgian divines, mm -hmm. all encouraging people and developing a, a theology of the suffering Christ mm -hmm. yeah. who was to be encountered in real people. And I think the theological motivation for lots of people in that time in terms of their devotion to the poor was fueled by those theologians mm -hmm. very yeah. much. Yeah. And to do something about it as well, they were also people who wanted um, Catholics to cultivate virtue, mm -hmm. which meant good behavior, yes. not mm -hmm. just good sentiment. Right, right. Yeah, and the devotes, thank you for reminding me of something I wrote about. I don't always remember things I wrote about, but um, the devotes were a very interesting group because they were, they were seen by some people as this kind of hidden cell of devout Catholics, lay people, priests, religious, uh, men and women who were kind of, they had these groups, they would share literature, they would go on retreats together sometimes, and they what they were, they, they were secretive in part because you actually had some resistant authorities, sometimes lay authorities, sometimes bishops who did not want to reform their diocese. They had to find ways to kind of work around a lot of inertia uh, in the institutional um, kind of setup of their society, including some of the church structures of the time to kind of get, get these projects up and running in a way that actually went forward and, and didn't get sort of halted by bureaucracy or something like that. So. So yeah, they had real concrete problems and the spiritual motivation was um, really the glue that held a lot of people together across, across a lot of boundaries, like uh, social boundaries and uh, other, other boundaries, yeah. 
So. Hi. Hi. Thank you again for a fantastic presentation. Um, I'm just thinking in relation to this um, universality of humanity, how much or if the Duchess traveled outside of France and if she did not, how was her worldview really formed? I mean, we're talking about patronage in North America right. in the 1600s. Well, that's actually, you've hit the, the question that most fascinated me about her when I started stumbling across the original sources because I learned pretty quickly she never left France. <coughs> uh, and yet she had patronage projects, uh, charitable, hospital projects, mission projects in Canada, the Caribbean, North Africa, Madagascar, Southeast Asia. She was even <coughs> dreaming up missions in a place they didn't know even existed yet. They had rumors called Les Terres Australes, or Australia. And, and they asked the Vatican to help them sponsor a mission there. And the officials there were like, but we're not sure it exists, so we're not going to do that. So um, she had this remarkable global vision that really a, a very few of her peers, even in high levels of French government, uh, did not have. And I, I really attribute it um, it partly to, she read widely, she read a lot of um, missionary writings coming back from Canada and other places. And her uncle, Richelieu, um, he kind of stepped in to help raise her after her, her parents died young. Um, he had a great library, he had diplomats coming in, having dinner, I think she was raised in a setting in her early 20s, she was constantly having dinners with people who traveled and, and, and heard a lot of stories. So she had this kind of, um, I, I think a real interest in what was out there, and she never traveled to these places, but she, what, what I think is remarkable, she didn't just romanticize those places, she thought about real problems people had, and she wanted to do something concrete about them instead of, and, and she was very, she was very responsible, like these were targeted donations, she was responsible with their gifts, she wasn't just throwing money at things just um, in a kind of, um, to assuage her guilt, like she was very concerned about making sure the donations were functioning as they were supposed to and that good people were, were responsible. She was very precocious in this regard as kind of an or, a business organizer. So I, I was just very impressed with her in that regard. I could go on and on about her, but um, yeah. She was kind of a pioneer, I think, even among, uh, I, don't, I don't know of a, a layman in her time who had public office that had quite this global vision that she had. It's really strange to see it. And maybe there are others that have been forgotten historically that someone will now look into now that I've written my book, but um, yeah. So, all set? Good, okay, I wanna take my water bottle. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bronwyn, thank you very much for a, a wonderful presentation. I think there were a lot of different things that we could learn from it. Among them is something more about Vincent de Paul. There's a lot of us that know a bunch about Vincent de Paul, and I always think I know a bunch about Vincent de Paul, but I could not have told you about the Duchess before I read your book either. I didn't read it twice like Aiden, but the year is still young. Um, but sh other than her connection with Ladies of Charity, I couldn't have said anything more about her. So thank you for that, because you told us about, uh, more about Vincent de Paul, how he worked during his lifetime, and also the way in which powerful women can do really good work when they're allowed to, when they get the resources to do the things that they can do. So thank you for doing that for us. You were a wonderful inaugural Vincentian Heritage lecturer, and I just hope that we can continue that series with uh, people like you. So thank you.